Good morning, this is Julia Witt up with Talk Story TV, and I have with me this morning Zeke Bambolo, and he is the author of a book called The Firstborn Son, and why is it called that, Zeke? Uh, Julia, thanks again for uh, having me on your show. Uh, thank you so much for being generous to me, and uh yeah, the book is titled The Firstborn Son, A Curse, A Gift, or A Calling. Uh, exactly. It tells a good bit of a story of my personal life as I present my uh, thoughts in this book. But the ultimate goal is to further the discussion of multi-generational family legacy within the culture. I think it's something that we have forgotten greatly. And yes. uh, if you look at the, the position of the firstborn son as a paternal legacy bearer, as a protector, a defender, a variety of other uh, positions that individual individual is expected to uh, fulfill, you will see that it has a lot to do with uh, propagating a proud family legacy. And so we wrote the book just to go bring us back to discussion within our homes and other pertinent locations, uh, the discussion of multi-generational family legacy for the family, for the culture, and for the improvement of our lives. Yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, we talked about this earlier, the whole, whole Hawaiian thing with Ohana. Did yeah. you ever go yeah. see that uh, Lilo and Stitch kids movie? You know, I haven't, I can't say I've watched the whole thing. I have seen bits and pieces okay. uh, of, the, of, the, of the movie, yeah. And uh, and I know the, the culture is certainly very steep in traditions of family. And I have a few friends from that culture that seem to, um, it's not just understand it, but it's the way they epitomize the, the values that are coming within the family and the, the, the bonds and the, from even not just the immediate family, but within the community as well. And very similar to the simplistic yet powerful African traditions that I bear myself, in that uh, part of what this is, my, my parents are uh, Africans, truly, I mean, Cameroonian. In fact, my mom and dad currently reside in Cameroon, Central Africa. And so my roots and my teachings and my upbringing in this whole concept of the firstborn son and onto this whole family legacy concept has a lot of deep roots in that, sim that simple African concept of understanding uh, how, com how important family and community is. And so I talk a lot about that in the book as well to hopefully provide a few uh, viewpoints that the Westerners uh, who may say, well, I don't quite understand what you're talking about can take some clues from just by understanding the actual existence within the family community. You know, in talking about little things as, uh, Julia, you know, when I was a little boy, sometimes I, I did things and there were times that neighbors have to give me a spanking and send me home with my parents to get another set of spankings there as well mm -hmm. uh, because my behavior was not uh, my behavior was not uh, acceptable and yes the simple thing that that was true for that time and may you know, have some people thinking have some of in our audience thinking right now is that uh, our values as a community back then were so strongly unified and, and similar mm -hmm. that my parents did not have a hard time embracing the fact that a neighbor had to do that to me and brought me home <laughs> to them. And, you know, and mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, your next door neighbor right now. Would you allow your next door neighbor to spank your son or your daughter? No, would you allow your next not. neighbor to even chastise <laughs> your children? We live in the same community and our views are so far apart. And that right there, see, that simple little description describes where we are and how, how far we've come from this great concept of family and community. Yes. 
I, I re I'm thinking one time I saw this little girl pushing her little sister, obviously, in a stroller, and she walked out into the street without really looking both ways. And I rolled down the window and I said, you did not look both ways, and be careful, you're taking care of that baby. And uh, my husband said, Julia, well, you don't know those kids. And I'm like, well, oh. <laughs> of course I don't know them, but I still. We, we, we still have a, a place of responsibility. That is, you know, this hierarchy of life from the, the old and the adult passing on down to the little ones. You know, there's still that responsibility that exists. And uh, it's sad. It's sad that I know a lot of adults in our community these days will watch something like that and go, well, it's not my child. I better just move on. And you know what? There are some young lives in grave danger should a car, you know, with no mal intent, come around the corner and do something, you know. And we know that our community has a whole lot more mal intent than we've ever had in, in the longest, uh, for the longest time in terms of the abuses that go on. But, yeah, even something that simple, you would think someone would, I mean, some people may be very, uh, appreciative that you do that, Julia, but yes. they're so high a risk that someone's going to come after you and say you did something to the child that's now caused them, you know, a trauma, a mental trauma <laughs> of some sort. Oh, I never you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it is, I know. It is, unbelievably, it is unbelievably important that we understand that, you know what, we've come a very far away from having a very a uh, 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 healthy society from some simple concepts that shouldn't be so grave uh, a distraction for us all. Yeah. I mean, all adults should tell children if they're, you know. I mean, she was pushing a baby in a baby little stroller. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so yeah. I was like, wow. But anyway, um, so tell us about you were raised, you were born in Africa, right? Yes, yes, um, and that's uh, a, a story to some because I was born and raised in Liberia, West Africa. My parents, however, were missionaries from Cameroon, Central Africa, to Liberia in West Africa, and uh, they were we were raised on a Baptist boarding institution, a Baptist boarding school, oh, okay. and they were both teachers there. And so that in itself, in terms of my story. Uh, talks about being raised in a very diverse, uh, you talk about Americans, Europeans, talk yeah. about Lebanese, talk about uh, Indians from the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Far East and so forth, and all of us coming together to build a very diverse community. Yet, uh, while growing up at about age 17, a civil war, uh, as I was just fresh out of high school, literally, a mm -hmm. civil war broke out that really uh, destroyed that uh, the, the life that I knew. And my parents, being serving in a foreign country uh, for close to 30 years by this time, lost everything we ever owned. Um, and there were no banks to go back and say, well, we want to go and get our money. Uh, literally, we left our homes with AK-47 rifles at our, at our backs from teen, teen, young teenage boys, literally. And uh, we were told not to turn around or look back, and they will shoot. And with that civil war, I'm, I'm kind of really cutting to the chase on a lot of things, but the civil yeah. war uh, was the when... <laughs> the Civil War was when the story uh, of my life in terms of understanding my role of the firstborn son, even though my dad had been teaching me that role since I was a little boy. But that was my first opportunity to really start to exercise my teachings. And, uh, and so I had, I had, even though we were running around and trying to just survive uh, from the missile and the rocket attacks that were dropping over our heads, uh, wow. uh, military jets dropping bombs here and there, and the atrocities that were going all around with people losing their lives for simple things, very simple uh, things, you would think maybe if someone wanted a pair of shoes that you want, that you wore, and you chose not to give them those pair of shoes. Uh, those are rebels, and where we live at that point in time will literally take your life Tell because you. it, it meant that it meant nothing, you know. So, yeah, that's a whole opportunity for me to come to that point of really my dad not expecting there was going to no, no one expected there was going to be a civil war, but when that came, and that opportunity came for me to live my life after what he had prayerfully taught me all those years. Uh, 
my book when I say is it a curse, a gift, or a calling? Literally goes through walking through the different moments of of emotions that were growing through my body, and mm-hmm. uh, and how to not only live that time and survive with all of those atrocities and our family struggles, but also coming to the United States a few years later, two or three years later, and having to restore my family from all that chaos and destruction back to the health that we currently uh, uh, happen to live today. So it's, it was an incredible journey, but such a powerful and transforming journey. Yeah, and you're so young to have gone through all that. I mean... Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, when, it, when, when life begins to teach, all life expects is that the student shows up. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter what you know, circumstances you're dealing with. And that's one of the things that I, you know, I, ter- I happen to speak here and there to high school students uh, frequently as well. Mm-hmm. And I think, Julia, again, what, what really I appreciate of that time when you say I was so young is that because of my teenage years and those battles and those struggles, I seem to be able to identify very closely with those teenage years and, and tell them the difficulties that they're going through with peer pressure, having to deal with rebel forces being forcefully conscripted and, and choosing not to become a part of that. I find that when I speak with the young people of the, of the teenage years, they can really connect and identify with my message because I can provide them with those the essence of, of, of being the teenage years and having those kind of pressures all around you to the point of having your life at risk at every moment that you live, but yet and still making a decision in the face of evil and those other things that were existing at that point in time. So I think as much as it was a pressure for a young age, you would agree that it was a gift that I was given that I can now share with our young lives. And I really enjoy doing those times when I talk with you with teenagers as well. And now you have your own son. Absolutely, absolutely. And now that the, now the, 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 the first day, you know, the, I would love to say it's a pressure, but the honor that I have now, you know, with the, I have a daughter who is seven. She'll be turning eight here in April. And mm-hmm. I have a son who is three and will be turning uh, four next month in February. And, yeah, now the, as I, my wife and I sit and we talk and look at where we are as a couple, where we are as a family. Part of what we really look at is, you know, uh, I write one of the, the talks that I give in my when I speak is, is your family name a recognizable brand? And I look at what the corporations have done to make you and I so loyal to them. For example, you know, I, 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 I give you a couple of uh, tests the last time. Like if I say, you know, fly the friendly skies. And you tell United. me that's what <laughs> United Airlines, you know, and, and so we, with, with, with a few slogans that I could throw at you, you would be able to tell me exactly who those corporations are because they have done a tremendous job of making us so loyal to their products. And they have used a term called family branding, which is absolutely a corporate brand, it has nothing to do with our traditional families. Yet and still, all of the characteristics, uh, all of the traits that they use to make the, that family branding successful are it's family traits on- that will make us absolutely will make us so powerfully strong as individual families and as a community yet and still we don't use it we don't even recognize that term honestly and so i say that just to say that my wife and i yes with the honor of having two young children now possess this position of how do we transfer the legacy of the bambolo name and the bambolo family to our young to those young lives in a way not just that to say hey you need to do this right you need to do that wrong but more, Julia, is how can we live exemplary lives? Because that is what really makes a difference. When they it doesn't see matter us what live, you say, it matters what you do. Very rarely matters what you say. Most of the time, I mean, but when they see us live a life that exemplifies exactly what we are telling them they ought to be, then it takes a whole lot different and a small powerful positioning. I mean, they be, it becomes their own. They take ownership. And I was talking, you know, I tell my young, even I was started as young as two years old, but I tell my children, even my son who is three right now, when he makes a mistake or when he does something very well, we begin by saying we're bambolos. And if it's something wrong, bambolos don't do that. Bambolos don't lie. And bullets don't cheat. You know, I coach my little daughter's basketball team, you know, as a seven-year-old. And, you know, she knows Bambolos work hard. And Bambolos want to win with grace and lose with dignity. You know, and so we, 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 all of a sudden now we start to speak to them in a term that they realize that the individual is not bigger than the family. 
and bambolas come first. And so when we when we live those lives, and, and we we can't just say it to them. We have to live that same exemplary life in our church. We have to do it in our community. We have to do it in our our, our work that we do day to day. You know, mm-hmm. and my daughter, all of a sudden, because I've written the book, and she watched Daddy working and speaking and and doing these interviews, and she, you know, now in her mind, she's already she she wrote we. Let me. This is funny. I, and permit me to say this. But my wife and I came up with. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I came up with what we call our statement of identity and vision, mm-hmm. and it's on. Uh, it's posted in our in our in our living room, uh, in a in a, a frame, and it just describes who we are as a family, what we stand for, what our values are. Mm-hmm. And you, you know what? It was so funny when I when we when I put that up. My daughter, who now she's she she reads very well and she can read almost any book in the home. And she came up by me, and we read that statement of identity and a vision together, even though we talked about it, but we read it together. The next day, do you know what she did, Julia? What? She went and wrote her own and posted it right next to the frame. Exemplary living. So powerful. And she wrote something, put it up there, and Daddy, I was so proud. To, you mm-hmm. know what, Daddy, this is what, you know, and just acknowledging who we are as bamboos. And uh, exemplary living cannot be substituted. It is such a powerful thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah wow yeah i'm glad you wrote that and you have plans for some other books right yeah yeah i mean I, as you as you mentioned that i was so the uh hopefully we can get that image here so this is this is the uh oh image. yeah that's great oh i uh, like that yeah, the first one sent a curse to get for a calling. And, yeah, our, we design, our desire is to certainly be, we want to write a variety of books in a series. And we want to look at this whole thing from several angles. Uh, my next thought here is to look at this whole, I've written from my own view as being the firstborn son. Mm-hmm. And what that's meant for our family, how successful that has served our family in a tremendous way, even in the face of war and adversity as we face. We are all now, you know, most of all of my siblings now live in the U.S. and we all have our families here. My mom and dad lived here for a little bit, and then they went back to Africa, where they now, they now, you know, just of their own choice, they prefer to live in Africa. Uh, very understandable because of the, where they are in life and the other family members that are down there. Yeah. Um, but I also have an, an older sister, so I'm the firstborn son, but not the first child. Sometimes people see that and they think, well, I'm writing this from because I'm the, I'm the oldest of my family. Now, I have a sister who's six years older. But it was by design that my father was and my mother were pretty keen to say, you know what, Ezekiel, or Zeke, you are going to be the, the one that carries the name of this family to, uh, forward. Be, it starts with you, and it certainly transitions on down to your brothers as well. Your sister, even though she's a part of this family, and she will certainly move on and carry that legacy forward to whoever she she marries. But usually she is moving on to marry someone else and will help to enhance that legacy, wherever, whoever her husband is, that paternal legacy. So... But I have had, always had my sister has been, she's been very supportive, very instrumental in my life. We have a very, very deep and strong relationship. And I think it's important as well, especially for having a, 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 a my first child being a daughter as well, to uh-huh. write my next book from the perspective of a firstborn daughter in support of this firstborn son. So my daughter has to support her brother in how he's moving forward with his paternal legacy bearer as he is right now. But wouldn't it be, I mean, for me, I think it's really intriguing and very important to understand deeply how my sister was able to walk this road and has been very supportive with me and has loved me all along this process to where our unity in the family still stands strong uh, with her by my side. And so I think it would be great to, and I believe yourself, you probably have some, really some, some experience as being a, a firstborn daughter for your family, I think. Yeah. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I'm firstborn, period. <laughs> but, yeah. Period. There you go. Firstborn daughter. There you go. So. Yeah, so so I think that's uh, and I you know would we'll love to certainly probably work in some collaboration there to really bring this subject back into a, that that whole uh, legacy discussion and the and the firstborn uh, son here, but the firstborn discussion also from the view of the firstborn daughter and what has what's that meant for your family? How have you seen your role and your position, and uh, what do you seek to transfer going forward in terms of where you've come from, where you are? And where mm-hmm. you hit it as a, as, a, as a family, as a person. Yeah. I think it's very important. I remember uh, when we talked another time, you told me about your grandmother. Would you 
like to tell the viewers about your grandmother in Africa? I would love to. What a what a part, what a lovely lovely story in my life. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, my my parents, my mom and dad were. Uh, missionaries in Africa and to Liberia no longer are kind of retired right now but yeah the story of how that how the church literally has become a, a big part of my family started with my grandmother and the fact that uh, my grandfather who I never really saw at all was a, a very terrific hunter and uh, woodsman and so when the Europeans began to move to Cameroon and Central Africa my father became a very uh, very good partner to have because he would go out and hunt wild boars. And when he got the boars, he would bring the boars back and he would melt the fat of the boars, which the Europeans back then and others used for oil, for lamps, and so uh -huh. forth. And so he became very instrumental to that, to their existence. And... Um, be became kind of a good trader with them. Uh -huh. And so... But unfortunately, he got sick at a very early age, about early 30s, he got sick and passed mm -hmm. away. And when he did, he had four children. I think the oldest was around, was around 12 or 13. But my father was only about a two or three-year-old young boy. Uh -huh. And so, but the villagers that, that where he lived, he had already married, he had also married a woman who wasn't of his particular tribe. And so there was a hint of jealousy. Uh -huh. Amongst the, the villagers that who because he had brought this girl into their into the town, he was very successful. And out of that jealousy, the the villagers after my grandfather died decided chose to burn down the home of my mother, of my grandmother and kick her out of the village with four young children uh, uh, in, in her possession. And uh, so they burned down the home the first time. She chose that, and she said, you know, she vowed that she had, her husband had brought her to this town, and she this is where she had born and raised her children so far, and that she was going to stay. And so she got some help, uh, basically on her own, being a very strong woman, and rebuilt her home. Well, they burnt the home down a second time. Oh, and uh, yeah. this time, some of the villagers said, you know what, it's probably best if you move, because this is getting pretty serious. So here's my grandmother at the time, moving, having to leave the town. And we're talking about back in the 1920s and, yeah. oh, excuse me, back in the 19, uh, yeah, 1920s, 1930s, where you don't have buses, you don't have, right. you know, transportation very readily available. And so her choice, Julia, to leave home was to go by the river to wait for several days because she didn't know when the next canoe was going to come across the river, which would take right. her to the other side, which would then allow her to go to the city of Port City called Douala, the largest, largest port city in Cameroon. But she did with her four children, and she waited by the riverside, and finally the canoe came, and she was sitting the other side. But she got there looking for some family members in the city of Douala and didn't know exactly where they were. Obviously, no letters, none of that kind. Didn't know where they lived, right. and she was just going to Rome until she found them. And this Greek merchant um, saw this woman with four young children, roaming pretty much homeless, and had another young uh, uh, Cameroonian woman working for him and said, hey, can you go and find out what's going on with that lady and her children? And the lady went and found it and heard the full story and told this Greek merchant. So what the merchant decided to do was to take, he decided to take this two or three-year-old boy that he saw because he fell in love with the, with the young boy. That young boy happened to be my father. So he has my father, now fatherless, and has just been adopted Literally, uh, I mean, there are no paperwork at that time, but literally been yeah. adopted by a, a Greek merchant and brought into his home. And the Greek merchant also told this young lady that was working for him that if you take care of the rest of them, I will pay you for doing so. And so he took my father as his own son, raised him up, uh, and supported my grandmother, who, because of her position now, also became very, uh, she sought refuge with the church became a very big part of the church back then. Even went on to, I believe, if, if I'm correct here, uh, you talk, you know, even went on to start a couple of churches of her own. Just, that's just a very strong uh, woman. And, and my father being raised by this Greek merchant who was also an Orthodox uh, Greek, you know, a, 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 a Christian, was uh -huh. raised in that Christian home and thereby with his mother's influence and his Greek Orthodox uh, father's influence, uh -huh. then became a missionary himself, which is how my father went to Liberia as a missionary in the 60s. Okay. So, 
<laughs> yeah. So 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 here's my grandmother. But but the, but the thing is here. So I'm, my, I hear the story of my grandmother. Obviously, much late, much further down the road in my life. Oh, as a as a young man, but. My father and my mother both worked as missionaries in this foreign land and worked at one Baptist boarding school, as I mentioned earlier, for close to 30 years and served so greatly that, I, you know, they're exemplary living again in terms of how they, uh, being just an African missionary, he was uh, given the positions as treasurer, he was a deacon in the church, he had several, I mean, you would think that he was the lead pastor, but he was simply a very humble and willing and hardworking servant. And so was my, mo my mother. And so I watched this exemplary living in my family. And this is the essence of legacy that I'm trying to describe for you. Uh, that I came up myself growing up and as a young man in the church, singing in the choir, being very involved yeah. in the different, mm -hmm. different youth ministries and everything else. Um, and even... Uh, Really, the church has become, because at this point in time, as an author, speaker, radio host, has also served as an elder on my church board with, uh, here in the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the legacy that began with my grandmother, transitioned on to my parents, especially the beginning yeah. of my father and his service to the church. I am, and my siblings, most, uh, also very, my sister and uh, a brother, only one brother, maybe he's not as committed, but he's still very much close to the church. So we all have our, our, our lives somehow a part of the current church culture. Uh -huh. uh, and it's no doubt that I desire my wife and I with our service right now, and I'm involved in deeply in our church community in, in so many ways, even leading marriages and mother of marriage study, marriage groups, uh, in, have all intent to pass on that legacy to our children, but they're watching us. They're yes. seeing us. So, you know, this whole story, even of this book that I, that uh, you hear, that you see written today, and my speaking began because of the choice of one African woman in a desperate situation that nobody will ever see, nobody will ever really hear about, other than me talking about her, mm -hmm. but. The, her legacy lives on so powerfully in my soul, mm -hmm. and it's going to be transitioned on right on down to her great grandchildren, and will clearly be to her honor and to her strong desire to do so. And I think that's exactly what we've lost in our culture: that strong uh, meaning and essence of multi generational family legacy. That's the power of legacy. And when it's transitioned properly, boy. What joy it is for me to tell, talk to my grandmother. What joy it is to watch my parents and their service. What joy is to know that I serve with a purpose, not just because I want to make myself feel good. That's a purpose for which I do what I do. And I'm so happy to pass on down to my children. My wife and I are so happy to pass on down to our children. That's what I'm writing about. That's what I'm speaking about. And if any viewers thinking, well, I didn't have that, but it can start with you. Absolutely. I mean, um, we write now a book. We write now. I mean, I do also. If you'll let me also show a little image here. For example, uh, I do a seminar. Uh huh. Six, six, successful family legacy. Okay. Yes, and it is a uh, it's designed as a day long or two day seminar that I literally come in and we we lay down the foundation and the groundwork to you know just encourage and teach people that you know yes. Even if you feel you don't have one, when I speak to, especially I speak to a lot of men's groups sometimes, I remember this, I was speaking in Canada a few months ago, about a month ago, and um, a young man literally came and was talking about his father and how he had pretty much rejected him and his mother and told them they were both sick in the head and they didn't want to end the deal with their lives. And, uh, and we talk about breaking a cycle because you know what? Legacy is not just, well, I want to leave wealth or I want to be uh, known as a great basketball player or musician or football player. Uh, it's not about, well, I'm in the latter stage of life, so what, 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 what do I really, what is my life really going to be about? No, it's, it starts as early as possible as we start to break the cycle of divorce. We start to break the cycle of child abuse. We start to break the cycle, I mean, you name it. And so, yes, you can, you can begin right now to to start to define what your legacy is going to be about. Start to build those those uh, tools or well, those uh, components within your family that are going to transition that legacy healthily. And we, we certainly want to be out there and come alongside people and say, hey, don't feel like 
you're lost or you a loser or whatever you want to call it because with some choices right now which is another thing that we, we, we why we enjoy talking to high school kids because we say you know what your choices right now are the ones that are going to determine and define and set if you want to be a great doctor if you want to be a great lawyer you know you make those choices now and start to put that, that legacy in place and you start to define what your brand looks like. You know, and that, that's the brand that we what people want to be attracted to because you know what your brand speaks of truth. Your brand speaks of integrity. Your brand speaks of you know of compassion. What is it? Yeah. But define it, put it forth, live it exemplarily, and guess what? You can transition it so easily. But it takes some choices. Mm -hmm. hmm. This has been a wonderful interview. Thank you so much for being on the show. I always, I always appreciate chatting with you. You, you, you know, you, you've already, in, in our short time of knowing you, you already give me some great inspiration. Um, as you can see, you know, it's not just being passionate about a subject, but it's about, it's about finding people that have like minds, to understand what you were you're saying, how relevant it is to our culture and our families and our society. And, Julia, you've given me the great opportunity to share that, and I, I appreciate it. Allow me to be passionate with you on your show and I hope uh, <laughs> our audience, I hope your audience will certainly feel that and see that you know, there's a lot to be to be uh, get, to be as received taken a lot to be given as well from our end to you and in your audience and we'll love to be a part of anything that you're doing out there to make sure that people see uh, there's great hope that's great that's great there's great you know there's a lot to be earned a lot to be had. I would love to uh, have, have you a, for I mean, a follow-up interview because I think we've barely scratched the surface <laughs> trust me I could open a, I could open a few Pandora, Pandora boxes for you and so but I, you know we, we, we will save some of the other beautiful stories for another time and certainly we would love to come back and chat with you again Okay. Thanks for being and, with uh, us. And if, if people want to, please remind oh. people want to get a copy of the book or what we do. There's the thefirstbornson.com is our website. Thefirstbornson.com. T H E is, the, is in the, the beginning of that. Thefirstbornson.com. And then also Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can always find our book there. The Firstborn Son: A Curse, A Gift, or a Calling. But our website will tell them how they can connect with us and a lot of other things that we're doing out there that we would love to partner up with them as well. And we have a little article by you on, don't we? Uh, or did we ever get said, that yet? <laughs> I will. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> thank you for I being will. with us. I am. It's a blessing. It's an honor. Thank you so much, Julia. Okay.